Today is Weird Science Wednesday, and uh, we're going to be talking with John Johns today from O'Reilly. We'll be doing uh, Kryptonite Candy. I uh, have a couple of the junior counselors hanging out with us today as well. And so today for Weird Science Wednesday, uh, we're going to, as always, ask you to ask us questions. Leave us comments below the Hangout. Uh, just type in all caps, question. Leave us a question. We'll have the MAKE team uh, corresponding back. And then Brian and Ben over the junior counselors. How's it going, guys? Hey. They'll be uh, taking your questions and asking John and Ibby and myself uh, throughout the Hangout. And then, like always, uh, it's Weird Science Wednesday, so if you have a question or you have an answer and you think we're getting it wrong, go ahead and leave us the answer in the comments um, and check it out. So uh, I'll kick it to John. Uh, John, how's it going? John and Ibby over there in the Makerspace area. Hey. Hi, Cam. How's it going? And uh, John, so what do you do at O'Reilly? Hi, campers. Um, at O'Reilly, I work with uh, communities. And one of the fun things to do is there's lots of community events and things like makerspaces and places. But what I like to do outside of work is I love Halloween as a holiday. I love making glow-in-the-dark candy and making crazy costumes and things like that. So make is a perfect fit for me. Well, do you like Halloween at all? I love Halloween. I'm big on dress up. <laughs> dress up is fun, but then there's also the party planner. So making a uh, punch that has dry ice in it so it smokes and things like that. So making kryptonite candy is uh, just perfect for Halloween. And there's still plenty of time for you to get all the ingredients and make a few practice batches before Halloween this fall. So some of the things you'll need, it's obviously candy. So you're going to need sugar. Um, <laughs> Just get a big bag of sugar, and uh, you'll need a cup and a quarter. Is that right? Uh, yes. A cup course. and a quarter for each batch of that. You'll need a strange ingredient, and this is what makes it glow. It's vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin. And if you order online, you can probably get it in capsules. Those are those little, uh, like little eggs that you can split apart, and the powder comes out. But when I go to my local store, they come in tablets like these. And when you get them in tablet form, you have to crush them up. So I got lucky today and went to a thrift store and bought a mortar and pestle for like two bucks at a thrift shop. And it's a cool little tool. It can be used uh, for anything in your uh, kitchen that it also looks cool at Halloween. It looks like you're a mad scientist. And we're going to be using it like a mad scientist. Now, I, I tried to break up the pills just as they were, but it didn't quite work. So I had to actually cut them up a little bit. And you can just cut them with a knife or a pair of scissors or something. And you get little uh, cut up pieces and put them in the mortar and pestle. And you just grind them up. And they turn into this great powder. And this powder, vitamin B2, is what makes the glow. Now, can we get uh, 150 mils of water? Yes, we can. The 150 mils of water is what we're going to use to um, put the water-soluble vitamin B2 in so that it will uh, become liquid. And then we can add it to the sugar that we're going to heat up. All right, there we go. So that's all ground up. So we need to heat the sugar. We're making candy. And what candy is is basically melted sugar that's then re-solidified into a form. And most of your candies are little round like the little peppermint wheels that are white and red. That's just sugar candy. It's pretty simple. So the first thing we need is the sugar, right? We need yeah. a cup and a quarter. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do some uh, cooking in the kitchen. So this is going to be hot. So if you're too young to maybe use the kitchen in your own, you probably need to have some supervision. The thing is about hot sugar, it's 250 or 300 degrees. It won't just burn you when it gets on your skin, but it's sticky. It'll stay there, and it's really hard to get off, and so it'll burn even worse. So you've got to be careful. You can wear safety goggles, safety first, gloves if you want. Mostly have an adult or a, a responsible person if you're an adult that's irresponsible. <laughs> yeah. All right, so here's half a cup of sugar. And total, we're going to add a cup and a quarter. And be sure to mix it really well so all the sugar gets dissolved. Now, one of the fun things that you're going to make with your kryptonite candy 
is you're going to form it into shapes. Remember I said that candy comes in little round circle discs? But candy can come in any shape you want it to be, makers. This is awesome. So we took some different items. If you want to show them the whistle and... Yeah, sure. Can you swap with me? See, we used just a couple things that I found around the lab. So we've got little bits of hardware. I think I used a couple big bolts as well. We have a whistle that is actually Nick's, his camp counselor whistle. And then I'm not even sure what this is, but I thought it was a really interesting shape and it'd be fun to make it a candy. Oh, and best of all, because of course it's kryptonite, we found a crystal that we made a mold out of. And we're soon going to stick all of these into a bed of rice to help it hold the shape once we pour the candy into it. Cool. So one of the other oddball things you'll need, not that any of this is an oddball, is a candy thermometer. Now, in order, you've got to use a candy thermometer with the sugar so you can get the right temperature. But I always wondered, Nick, what's the difference between a candy thermometer and any other thermometer? Uh, you know, John, I think we actually have uh, Ben and Brian who did some research on that. Uh, Brian, you want to take it from there? So the difference between a candy thermometer and a meat thermometer is the range at which it can measure temperature. Uh, a candy thermometer is uh, able to read from 40 degrees to 400 degrees, where a meat thermometer is a range from 0 to 350 degrees. And what's nice with the candy thermometer is it's an increment of one degree, where a meat thermometer usually only goes down about two degrees. And when making candy, you need to have a pretty precise temperature. That's great. That's great information. And uh, important to have a candy thermometer because your sugar, if it's too hot, it'll burn. And it won't, it won't uh, taste bad, not only that, but it will um, look bad as the candy. What we want it to be is this crystallized, glowing, kind of translucent kind of thing instead of just black sugar, because that's not good to eat. So John, can I ask you, um, what are the temperatures that we're dealing with, and are they in Celsius or Fahrenheit? It's Fahrenheit, that's a good question. Okay, and so... The first step of the process it is 200 degrees? Yes, we're heating it up to 200 degrees, stirring it the whole time, making sure everything gets dissolved. And then once it hits 200 degrees, I'm going to continue heating it, but no longer stir it. And then once it hits 300, that's called the cracking temperature, which is very important when you're making candy. And then we're going to add food coloring and everything, and it's ready to mold. OK. So uh, as you were saying, I think, earlier with the molds, it doesn't really matter what you choose for a mold, right? You could do anything at home. You could do stuff that's lying around in the cupboard or like a drawer, as long as you use the, the aluminum foil um, to actually make that mold and then the rice to kind of like support it. Is that right? Absolutely correct. And if you don't have any toys or anything to mold, you can just simply use a tray like this and fold it up and make strips of candy. Whatever okay, you so want. Can you hold I that up, John, prefer, so we can see it? I uh, prefer to use uh, toys and uh, Lego, Duplo Legos or something like that. Uh, like the cool 3D printed crystal that we used, or a whistle, or pretty much anything. Hey, John, uh, when you're heating it up, uh, how quickly can you heat it up? Can you like turn the, the temperature all the way up and just quickly, or do you want to slowly heat it up? Um, I think if we did it earlier and it worked pretty good on three quarters of high heat. Yeah, ours we heated up pretty quickly. I'm actually not very experience in making candy, so I'd definitely look that up. Um, I think heating it up quickly is all right, though. Okay, cool. It's not the time, it's the temperature. That's why we use the thermometer. If it only takes you five seconds using a, you know, a flamethrower, that's probably okay, as long as you stop the cooking temperature. <laughs> well, we are mad scientists. So, um, now, after we've done all this and we pour our molds, the kryptonite candy glows. But what makes it glow? Does it just glow in the dark naturally? Well, it glows best with an infrared light, now, or I'm sorry, uh, a yeah. UV light, a black light. And we have a little uh, uh, flashlight, and we also have one of these little bars. But I wonder what makes the UV light make the vitamin B2 riboflavin glow? How does that work? It has to do with photons, and I think one of our junior counselors knows all about that. 
Uh, that's right. I looked it up um, earlier today, actually. Light is made up of photons, um, or small bundles of electromagnetic energy. Uh, the UV lamp uh, emits light at a higher energy level than visible light, and it's outside of our range, so we can't actually see it. But what it does is it hits the candy's atoms, and it elevates the electrons in energy level. Once the energy level is up, it will continue in a cycle. And when it goes down to the normal energy level, uh, it emits a photon of visible light, which you can actually see. That's crazy good information. Thank you. I love science. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, all that science stuff makes candy glow. Mm -hmm. So you can like it on three different nerve levels. <laughs> so we're going to try pouring some now. I'm using a funnel. Remember, it's 300 degrees sugar. It's sticky and hot. So we're using all the care we can. I have okay, my... So, Go ahead. Sorry, John, I was going to say, wait, wait, wait. So I'm, I must be like on a sugar high. So we're, we're still making molds from sugar. I mean, that's the basic part, right? I mean, there's a couple things going on. So Ben's talking about like subatomic particles. You're talking about cooking. But let's go back to the beginning. We're actually just still making a mold, right? Correct. We make a mold using aluminum foil around a toy or an object or something, and then we're pouring hot sugar into the mold. When it cools, which is a while, probably an hour or so, when it's finally cool, it's going to be a hard piece of candy that glows in the dark. Got it. So that's where Ben comes back into play in talking about the photons and the energy states. Mm -hmm. So once we actually cool the sugar down and it solidifies, it'll then actually kind of glow under UV light. So the UV light is the important part. Is that right? It's very important. Um, obviously, the sun emits all rays of light, but the non-UV light is so bright that it blocks out all the UV. So it's best if you're in a dark room or something like that you can use your black light. Now, at Halloween, it's easy. When you're having a Halloween party, the dark is your friend. And you can have other glow-in-the-dark things. You can have glow-in-the-dark stickers on the walls and ceilings. Um, even without anything, your teeth are going to glow and your eyes are going to glow and your fingernails in the dark because they have glow-in-the-dark properties that reflect in UV light. But your candy is going to be awesome. It's going to look like kryptonite. And so, do we add flavors to this at all, or is that a later step in the process? Right before you pour, you should stir in your flavors. And I chose mint, just because mint's easy, uh, and it's green candy. We're going to use a blue food color to the yellow stuff. And uh, so that's going to be good. And you can use anything you want. You can use mint or green apple. If you're using blue, you can use raspberry. You don't even have to. You can make blue strawberries. You can do whatever you want. Cool. Have you tried any other colors? Absolutely. I tried blue. I've seen the glow-in-the-dark green that Becky used, and uh, I've used red. But the red turns out pretty orange simply because the B2 vitamin powder is kind of yellow, and it turns the sugar yellow naturally. You okay, so John, you were mentioning oh, sorry, the video. Is that right? There's, we have a reference video, don't we, that uh, has Becky Stern on uh, Make Projects? That is correct. Um, there's a, a video of her making it in her kitchen and the instructions as well. And that's on mixing. Very cool. We'll throw up the, uh, the link for that in the comments or uh, under the post. So we're going to pour because it's time. It's 300. So at this point, we've actually reached the proper temperature, the 300 degrees. Correct. OK. And we're being very careful because it's very sticky and hot. That's good. Nice. So that's one. <laughs> it is hot. I can it's feel hot. the pan. <laughs> okay. And then we have one that's, uh, we don't want to touch these because they're super hot. But we have one we did earlier of a whistle. And it's not quite solidified, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. Because it's not, it's not so hot I can't touch it. So in the close-up cam, you can see this uh, just a little bit. But the whistle is what we used. Do we have a whistle still? Uh, I moved it. Actually. Oh, there it is. So this is the whistle we used to form. It's actually the Maker Camp boss's whistle. And then the mold, and it's starting to, it's cool immediately, but it'll solidify into a hard piece of candy. And it'll glow in the dark. It's pretty hard to see. 
in the daytime, but uh, with a black light, you can definitely see it sort of glow. If you can see this, it's hard to tell it. Oh, there it goes. You can kind of see it. More so than just any light, it glows. And uh, the first one we did was only the yellow from the vitamin, sure, from the vitamin B2. But uh, so it's only yellow. But if you make it blue, it'll glow blue. If you make it orange, it'll glow orange. So here we go. It's still glowing a little bit. Not a lot, but you can tell. You can see it flashing when the light goes over it. That's the glow and dark properties of vitamin B2. Very cool. So Brian and Ben, have you guys ever uh, experienced this kind of like fluorescing phenomenon? That's kind of what it's called, isn't it, Ben? It's fluorescing when it re-emits light? Uh, fluorescence is becoming increasingly common in uh, modern day use. Fluorescent lights actually use the same principle, although they don't use B12. They use a, a different phosphor. And use mercury. And mercury, yes. Don't touch the fluorescent lights. <laughs> um, the, uh, in nature and in a number of children's toys, uh, you see for phosphorescent material, which is different from fluorescence, Wow. And that when you turn the light off, it will continue to glow. So like the glow-in-dark stars that you have put on your ceiling and like little glow-in-dark animals or toy balls and stuff like that, that's phosphorescence instead of fluorescence. Got it. So there is a difference. There is a difference. Okay. Say, uh, John, how did you come up with the, this awesome candy? Well, I didn't come up with it. I found it on the Make Scene blog. Um, and was it about a year ago or maybe more that Becky put up her walkthrough and her video? And uh, it looked really fun. I mean, I watch anything Becky does because she's super awesome. But the candy thing fits into my theme because I like Halloween. And uh, I, a friend of mine, Dave, we uh, go to his house and we set up his house. We make a yard and we make little fake little gravestones and we'll put, like, the name, like, Rose, like, there's a poor deceased woman named Rose, and then we'll plant a rose on her grave, and Lily will plant a lily. And so we have a themed yard, and uh, we have lots of spooky sounds. And this fit right into our whole theory of how to have a Halloween party and glowing candy. And if you make enough, if you're super generous, you can give it out. You can wrap it in cellophane and give it out as candy treats on Halloween. That's cool. Cool. Do you yep. guys do anything fun for Halloween? Well, we dress up. I dress up at least. Make usually dresses up in costumes for the day of, and that's usually entertaining. Well, it's got to be fun because you can make uh, LED costumes. You can light mm -hmm. your costumes. You can use cardboard to make cardboard robots. Mm -hmm. You can make anything. There's lots of make issues, the Halloween issues, there's mm -hmm. three or four, I think, mm -hmm. and I love those, and fashion technology has got a lot of great tips in there about making costumes, too. Cool. I'm a Halloween nerd, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great, because, like, last week was Comic-Con, and there were so many great costume ideas at Comic-Con. So, I'm a costume junkie. <laughs> While we're waiting for the uh, candy to cool, have you ever tried putting the candy in a freezer to make it cool faster? Uh, the, I think the issue is that is you definitely have to get it to room temperature, which takes maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. And then after that, you have to get it to refrigerator temperature. You've got to do it slowly. If you put it in the freezer, it will set faster, but it will also crack. Mm. Shrinking. So if you... Get it to room temperature and then maybe put it in the refrigerator for a while and then put it in the freezer. But by that time, it would probably solidify at room temperature. Oh, okay. But after it's at room temperature, you could freeze it and, I don't know, maybe have it frozen floating in your punch <laughs> with some dry ice and then glowing. That there would be kind of creepy. You could make it in the shape of bones or <laughs> there you go. And have it floating in your red punch. I think that would be a great idea. Cool. Definitely creepy. I like it. <laughs> oh, I heard something. So, uh, are we getting any questions at all? 
Yeah, let's check back. Uh, we'll ask the campers again if you want to leave questions or comments. You can do it under the post. Uh, just type in the word question, uh, type it out, and we'll have the MATE team uh, ask the questions for you. And likewise, if you have some answers for us, if you think you know something else to contribute, you can always write answer um, in the comments under the, the post that we're having right now. Um, so John, I was asking, I was thinking of a question um, around the office. I've heard you're quite the candy guy. Is there a, a particular story that goes along with that? Not really a story. I am a candy guy. My desk is full of candy. I think I have seven candy jars, and I know what all the important people at work like, so I get the special candy for them. <laughs> but mostly it's just uh, something to give back. There's a lot of companies out there that have great benefits, and our company has great benefits, but candy is just a freebie. It's just a, a little treat that you can get. And when you work in an office and six hours go by or eight hours go by and you're just running low, a little sugar can perk you right up. And uh, chocolate can make you happy too. Chocolate's got some chemical properties that make right. you very happy. I don't know what they're called, endorphins or something. <laughs> but chocolate's good. So I have loads of candy at my desk. And I also love to get weird candy. There's a couple of local candy shops in uh, Windsor, California, and uh, I think in Healdsburg, California. And those candy places have retro candy, so you can get the best. old candy that maybe you haven't seen in your candy store for a while, but they're still being produced, and you can get fun candy and strange candy from around the world, like Turkish Delight and uh, different kind of candy crystallized ginger. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, European candy bars that are similar to ours, but they're just slightly different. And in Japan, they have a milk candy. It's like a Tootsie Roll, but it's white, and it's just sweetened milk candy. Candy is weird, and I love candy. I don't eat a lot of it, but I love it. It's interesting to me. And making treats at Christmas, too. Mm. All right. Uh, so, Brian, do we have any questions coming in from the campers? Or Ben? Yeah, uh, this is a question from Stephanie. She's wondering, uh, does it glow when the candy dries or finish, is finished? That, that's a good question. Yes, it glows now while it's wet, and it glows when it's dry. Uh, it's the same glow. I don't think it changes intensity at all, simply because the vitamin B2 riboflavin is what's making it glow, and it doesn't change chemically. It's a water-soluble uh, vitamin, and we grind it up into a powder, and uh, it dilutes into the water, and it doesn't change properly. So it glows the same from start to finish. And you know, John, I was watching the video uh, before the Hangout today, um, and I saw that, does it matter if you keep on adding more and more riboflavin, those little tablets, will it glow even more? Or is there a certain point that you just can only have so much riboflavin to make the candy actually glow once it's done? I think I used three 100 milligram tablets and adding any more isn't going to make it glow more, but adding less, it may not dilute as much. So the proportions for that, chemically speaking, about 300 milliliters of, or I'm sorry, 300 milligrams of powder in the amount of water that we use dis dissipates just light. Okay. And so right as you add the riboflavin, it'll actually start to glow. I mean, it can even see it glowing in that pot if you were mixing it, right? Absolutely, yes. And the other cool thing is, you know, in order for this to work, you're going to have to get a black light. A black light bulb that can screw into a lamp, one of these little fluorescent lamps, a flashlight. Whatever you need, you're going to have to have it to make it glow. But the fun thing is, so many things glow naturally. So if you go outside with a black light at night when you're catching fireflies or stargazing or something, who knows what crazy plants will glow differently. And when you're going around your house, you can see all kinds of stuff glowing. And in your kitchen, lots of things have riboflavin in them, B2, and so they'll glow. But there's other things that glow under UV, and it's fun just to go on an adventure around your house looking at things that glow. And the best of all is in the bathroom, with all the lights off, in the mirror, and you look at your face glow, and your teeth glow, <laughs> and your eyes glow, and it's just cool. Black light's awesome. I think so. I think it's fun. <laughs> so has anyone heard of uh, the anomaly that happens at the beach when uh, late at night you're kind of walking down yeah. and uh, you can walk around and kind of kick the water and something kind of happens? Uh, John, have you seen that before? I have. It's like... It's bioluminescence. 
Bingo. <laughs> so what is what is bioluminescence, Ibby? Do you know what uh, what it is? Um, it's like a very small type of plankton, I'm pretty sure. And something about when they're agitated, they start glowing. And so when the water is calm, it's fine. But if you've ever seen like the waves, once they crash, the waves start glowing. Like if you paddle through them with a kayak, like around your oars and stuff, it starts to glow. So I'm not exactly sure why they do that, but it's a really cool effect. Did you know it's not only algae? Other plants and animals do it too uh, throughout nature. It's primarily considered a defense mechanism. Oh, really? Some That's fish cool. and other things <laughs> will see the, that and be scared away. But so it sounds like bioluminescence is really just like whenever nature is glowing, essentially. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, if I was walking around and I saw Nick glowing, <laughs> I would run away. <laughs> so it's a good defense mechanism, I think. Sure, I don't think I'm comfortable eating too many things that are glowing. No. Unless, of course, point. I've made it and I know why it's glowing. <laughs> so, John, have, what's your favorite flavor to use with the candy? Well, today we use mint, but I also like uh, like raspberry, and um, at the grocery store that I went to where all the uh, little vials of flavored oil extracts, mm -hmm. there's so many to choose from. Vanilla is the most common, but vanilla is vanilla. It's vanilla plain, and it's okay, but it's not fun. Mm -hmm. uh, mint was easy, and I like mint, but there's also raspberry, and uh, I think there's some other crazy things, like foreign flavors like tamarind, which is foreign to wow. me. It's not foreign to the world, it's foreign to me. Tamarind and some other things like that. So another fun experiment, because you're going to be making a few batches before Halloween, I'm sure, to practice, is to also practice with different flavors, doing some different color combinations. And uh, the cool thing about food color is you can mix two colors together too. And so you can mm -hmm. make, you know, uh, red out of, and yellow and make an orange candy and use maybe a mandarin orange flavor to it, or you can make it opposite so that it's orange raspberry. Mm. Cool. Okay. But it's fun. So John, can I ask you back to the molds again, what are some good tips and techniques for making your molds come out okay? It sounds like we're just using aluminum foil at this point, right? Uh, do we need to make sure that the, the aluminum foil doesn't get a crease in it, or is there a way to kind of make really good channels? Like how did you and Ibby uh, make your homemade molds? Well, Ippy started with some of the molds, so I'm going to let her start. Yeah. Um, one tip is just realize that the top part is going to be open, so you can't really mold that. So maybe when you're wrapping it, too, keep that in mind. For, like, for example, when we wrap the crystal, I think you can see in the hand camera, um, we wrapped it from the bottom up, so we got that pointy shape at one end, and it's going to be kind of funky at the top, but oh well. Because if you wrapped it this way, you'd only get like a little bit of the trough bit. Um, so keep that in mind, and yeah, you know, another thing is like when I was wrapping like little bits of hardware, I sometimes stacked them so they're more column-like, um, just so you can have a larger piece of candy. But yeah, I don't know, just be patient, be aware that some of the candy might spill out if the edges aren't too good. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward, it's fun. Okay, great. The great thing about making mistakes on your first three or seven batches before <laughs> Halloween starts is if it doesn't form right, or if the candy breaks or anything, is it still tastes good, so you can just mm -hmm. eat it. There you go. So practice before Halloween and get just the right set of stuff. And grab a bunch of different toys around the house. Mm -hmm. Blocks and wheels and sticks. And so or you guys, could we, could we use this same recipe without the vitamin... Uh, and the riboflavin to make it glow, would it still be the same candy? Absolutely, yes. It's just sugar and flavor and a little water. Um, and it's classic candy making. If you ever uh, watch cooking competitions, sometimes the chefs are making um, sticky, sugary baskets and stuff. That stuff's really hot. It's 300 degrees sugar. And it's very sort of dangerous what they're doing, but they're professionals. But that's all this is. It's basically a, a sugar syrup. We're just using it for demented. <laughs> so again, really, when you have that sugar at 300 degrees and it's ready for use, 
Um, it's kind of more like a molten mess, right, at that point. Do you let it cool a little bit, or do you immediately add the ingredients? Um, as soon as it reaches 300, immediately add the ingredients and stir it again. So you're going to add the food coloring and the flavoring, stir it, and then pour it as quickly as you can. Because you don't want it to get too much hotter or stay too long at that temperature because it might burn. And nobody likes burnt candy. Um, but then also you don't want it to cool too much before it's in the mold because you don't want it to get hard or just anything happen. So you got to work fast is really what you're saying? Just yeah. yeah be, that's a very, be safe and work fast. Yeah, that's a very crucial moment right there when it hits 300. Okay. There's two things happening in the pan. You're heating what's in there, which is water, the riboflavin, the sugar, and, <clears throat> and the food color. But in heating it, there's a lot of evaporation going on. The water that the sugar is, has uh, melted into is evaporating. And so if you leave it for too long, all the water evaporates, and it turns back into this sticky, sugary mess. So timing is perfect. You know, that's the core thing, the temperature and the time. And is this uh, something that's good to, uh, to work in pairs? I know, uh, John and Ibby, you're working together today. Was it easier to have an uh, extra set of hands for the pouring and the stirring? Uh, definitely, yeah. Especially for the pouring, just because it's so hot. Like, you want to be really careful. Um, and, like, you notice we had a funnel, because we didn't have a ladle with, like, a little spout. I know some they do exist. But this worked really well. Just put the funnel straight over the mold and pour it in. And that way you don't have to worry about dripping on anything. The other cool thing about having a partner is, you know, it's kind of sad when you're doing it alone. <laughs> you don't have anybody to share your really cool idea with, and um, eating candy alone is kind of sad. Too. Yeah. Sharing is the best. It's another reason why I have candy all over my desk. Very cool. And so I've also heard that your results could vary depending on your altitude. Um, does that have something to do with the boiling temperature and the heat and, um, and the atmospheric pressure going down? On this? All those things are correct. Okay. Well, I don't so, depending know on, so depending on where you are and at what altitude, um, you could have to uh, increase your temperature? I think the temperature might be okay, but it would just boil at a lower temperature if you're at a higher altitude. Okay. So don't base it off the boiling. Just make sure it gets the right temperature. Got it. So the temperature is really that, that key point. Yeah. Okay. Brian and Ben, do we have any more questions from, uh, from campers coming in? Yes, we do. Um, we have a question from Howdy Faith 5 that asks, can you let it cool like a putty, then mold it? Oh, interesting. That's a, great, uh, that's a great idea. I would definitely use maybe some rubber gloves or something so that it wouldn't stick and maybe... Um, dip your rubber glove covered hands in cold water before you start molding the sugar into whatever shape you're going to mold it into. Um, I'm going to show you on the close-up cam what this looks like after, what's it been, an hour maybe? Yeah, something like that. It's still um, liquid and goopy. It's still moving around in the form. So I don't know when it's going to get to the point where it's going to be moldable, if you will. But if you could get it to that point, I don't think it would be a problem. You just have to worry about sticky burning and getting it to the right consistency where it's moldable, but it'll, it, it'll stay, it'll crack, it'll mm -hmm. harden properly. But yeah, it'd be a really uh, an interesting experiment. Definitely, yeah, because if, if it's possible to mold it like that, you could have a lot of fun just like building different things. Yeah, you can build different shapes. Um, so again, if you're out, uh, it was, I think the question was from Haley. Uh, if you document it, be sure to uh, hashtag MakerCam. Let us see what happens, you know? Take pictures. Film a video. Pictures. Do a hangout with your friends on Google+, Plus, and then publish it to YouTube and share us the link. Another idea could revolve around injection molding. If you could find a material high enough for... Uh, the candy not to uh, vaporize it and it won't introduce anything bad to your candy, you can make some interesting shapes that way. That'd be really cool. Uh, ben and Brian, could you guys talk about injection molding then and that kind of idea? What is, what is injection molding and how could you use that for candy? So basically injection molding is you make a, a mold, uh, usually it's out of metal is, the, is what the mold's made out of, 
that has the three object that you're making cut into the mold, the negative of it. And so the mold goes together in two pieces, and then they inject through uh, holes in the side of it uh, whatever material. So a lot of times it's either plastic, a lot of plastic parts are injection molded. Uh, you can do metal, it gets a little bit tricky. But so can you be a great idea if someone can do it. The only downside is injection molding tends to get a little expensive, so you'll have to think of a pretty clever way to, to do it at, uh, with a very low cost. Yeah, that would be a cool project, though. Well, I was thinking about 3D printing, but I, I'm not sure what the temperature of the 3D printing printer plastic melts at. I know it's about 280 Celsius. Okay. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, though. So. Well, and actually, I've seen, um, I think there's a, a CNC machine out there that's like a cupcake printer. Have you guys seen that, where it actually extrudes frosting? So no, it's not quite like candy, but again, it uses like a, a 3D printing nozzle, um, mm -hmm. and you can print different colors and shapes uh, with your hard candies, even. I've, yeah, I've seen that one, the frosting one, and I've seen one that does it with chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. So that's some high-tech candy uh, action going on there. So cool. <laughs> I like it. Maybe you could build a molten candy extruder and lay it down. Oh, it would take too long to cool, though. Well, and yeah, they also like actually had the, uh, they had the frosting extruder at Maker Faire. Um, I don't know if you saw that. That was pretty cool. Mm. Be pretty clever to see what you guys out there can do with this. Yeah. Hmm. So John, what's uh? We're just kind of waiting for our candy to cool. Is that the correct? That's the next step. That's kind of the final step we're at. Absolutely. It takes a while. It may take uh, up to an hour and a half to two hours for it to actually be solid. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be patient. You make your candy, and then you go maybe write a Google Plus post, uh, go outside and do some filming, go work on your CNC machine or your 3D printer or whatever it is you do. Um, if you have multiple projects, that's the best way because sometimes you have to have paint dry, you have to have your candy cool. You can work on your costume. Your Halloween costume. <laughs> there you go. That's what I do. When I get tired of working on my costume or I need the glue to dry, I go work on a batch of candy. Very cool. And so I'm wondering, too, um, what do you think about making different shapes with the mold? It seems like if it was a really shallow, kind of thin mold, that might dry faster, whereas that whistle is kind of a thick, um, large volume object. Uh, maybe it would take a lot longer to cool. Uh, it'd be a cool really? experiment to see how, how you could get different shapes to cool faster, you know, by doing really flat, uh, spread out sheets. So I'm going to do several projects over the next three months, four months until Halloween, and I'm going to try and time them. Um, not try and time them. I'm going to try them, and I'm also going to time them. And I'm going to post my results and take pictures. So you'll be able to see for a deep, deep mold like this one of this device, you know, is it going to take a lot longer? Or if it's big and deep, you know, how big can you make a mold? Can you make a mold that uh, the outside uh, solidifies and maybe the inside cools so you can make a bowl or something? I'm going to work on several different things, and I'll post my timing results because I know a lot of people are interested right now, but Halloween's a long way off, and they'll wait until the last minute. By Halloween, I'll have all the information you need and some cool different flavor and color experiments. And that'd be awesome for Halloween if you can make little like sugar skulls. Oh, oh cool. yeah, that'd be cool. I, I have just the perfect little skull too, or you could 3D print it. There you go. Injection molding. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian and Ben, how about uh, more questions coming in from campers? Yeah, we have one from Courtney. Do you have to keep stirring the sugar like after you put it in? Yeah, you, you're going to put everything in the pot and stir it until it hits 200 degrees because you want to make sure everything is completely dissolved by that point. So, yeah. And then after 200, after 200 degrees, Don't touch you it. stop stirring until it gets to 300. Yeah. Pour in your flavor, food color, stir that in and pour it in molds. Yep, exactly. That was a good question. We also have a question from 
um, secret sold asking whether or not the maker bot could be used to extrude this material. Ooh. And Interesting question, but it's not my area of expertise. Well, it'll get hot enough. Um, I don't know if I want to risk that on my 3D printer, though. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you'll have to do a few mods to, to be able to hold the, the solution, because usually with like the maker bot, you're using uh, rolls of filament, yeah. where this is kind of a goop. And you'll have to make a whole mechanism to hold that, but it should work. The only downside is it does a layer, and you let it cool. Well, PLA and ABS cools relatively quickly, where this takes about an hour. So you could use like that, but I think what you'll have to do is either have some way of cooling it faster, like do thin layers and cool it quicker, or do it a print over like a day. So it does like a layer every 10 minutes or something like that. Oh, okay. So it'd be super slow. I have a quick question. So this vitamin B2, does it have any like health benefits or is it bad for you if you have too much? Like, does it affect your, your health at all? Well, it's a vitamin and all vitamins are good for you. Um, <laughs> and the, the good thing about vitamin B2, it's similar to vitamin C, which is what's in your orange juice and stuff like that. They're both water soluble. There's a lot of water soluble vitamins. And what that kind of means is, is you can't take too much of it. So um, when you get a cold, sometimes there's a, uh, some medicines that you can sprinkle into water and drink them, and there are mm -hmm. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C to boost your system. Well, your system will use whatever it needs. If it only needs 800 milligrams, then the rest will just pass through. So water-soluble vitamins are where it's at. And this is that. Um, what it's good for, I'm not sure. It says supports nervous system health. So that's always a good okay. thing. <laughs> Especially when you've accidentally poured hot sugar on your finger and it hurts because you know, it's a good sign. <laughs> that you can feel. But it's not bad for you. It's just a vitamin pill. Mm -hmm. A supplement, if you will. So there's nothing wrong with eating too much of this candy then. <laughs> hey, John. We've yeah. got a question from Leo. Have you tried butterscotch? Like, would that be a good flavor? Ooh. Leo, that is awesome. <laughs> I'm currently working with my son on making... Harry Potter's Butterbeer mm. for the fall. And so we're working on some different butterscotch and uh, root beer and cream soda recipes to make a butterbeer with a big frothy head on it. And butterscotch is a great idea for the candy because the little yellow candies Perfect. are butterscotch. That's brilliant, Leo. I love that idea. That's on my list. Speaking of flavoring, have you ever tried it without flavoring? Uh, I have, and it really just tastes like plain sugar. It's, it's very flavorless. It just tastes like sugar candy, and uh, that's fine if you just want sugar, but flavor is where it's at. Yep. Um, we got another question from Laro. Will this candy stick to teeth or braces, or is it like not a sticky candy when you eat it? It, it's a hard candy once it's finished. It's not gummy at all. Okay. Correct. It will, uh, but like any hard candy, you could, you know, it's made to dissolve slowly in your mouth. It's not really made to crunch. You can crunch it, but if you're not careful, you could break one of the wires from the mm -hmm. braces or something. So hard candies are made to slowly uh, dissolve in your mouth. It's not really made to crunch although people have jawbreakers because it breaks their jaw. I'm not sure how that, I'm not sure the attractiveness of jawbreakers, but... But essentially, it's the consistency of, like, a, you can think of a Jolly Rancher, right? I mean, it's the same idea. It's a hard candy. So I've had those stick to braces before. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it will definitely bend your braces in ways you don't want it to. Dentists would frown upon it. <laughs> five out of... Four out of five dentists would not approve. <laughs> And that question was from Leo, not Lero. No. It Thank was you. actually from Lero. Uh, that was a mistake. It's all good. Either way. <laughs> Thanks for the question. It's a great question. <laughs> mm. So, what are we going to do for Halloween? Are we going to make something? lots of candy. Are we going to do something in the Make Labs for Halloween? What do we do here? Mm. Ooh, that'd be fun. Costume party. 
I know there was a project a while back where, uh, it was a few years back where we made taffy. We had like a taffy machine. Oh my god, one of those things that do this? Mm -hmm. Crazy. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I think we should have a costume contest. We could make glow in the dark taffy. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally glow in the dark taffy. That would be awesome. Salt water. Glow in the dark salt water. Glowing salt water taffy. Then it's bioluminescence. The, the salt water <laughs> fish will eat it. <laughs> I don't know if fish like candy. Do you I don't know. I don't know either. Well, do you think the candy is more like a sucker or rock candy? It's more like a sucker, less like rock candy. Rock candy forms its crystals more uniformly, and this isn't. This isn't, it's crackle temperature, it's not really crystallizing. I think there's a lot more um, chemistry involved in making mm -hmm. crystal sugar, big crystal sugar, like rock candy. I think there's some chemistry in there that I don't know how to do. That's mm -hmm. I don't think I know how to do that. I think so. I'm pretty sure like rock candy you don't bake, but I'm not sure about that. So if you took one of those capsules and just shone a UV light on it, will it shine by itself? It's an excellent question. Do you want to try it? Live on air. Very little. Very, very little. I don't know if it requires that it be dissolved in water that makes it glow or... Try the... Wow. Uh. Because the pills do have like a protective coating over it. Mm-hmm. But still it doesn't. But the water that we made earlier, we used some water to test uh, if the pill would dissolve. And it glows like crazy. It's hard to see, but... Yeah, it's really hard to see. But it glows. <laughs> it's still, it's sort of, you can sort of see it. Mm -hmm. That is a wild color, yeah. So that's just the vitamin D tablet and water. So mm -hmm. it's very yellow. So you have to, depending on what pill you get, which may be white, it may be green, I don't know. But this yellow pill, it's challenging with the, which uh, food color you use. Mm -hmm. Because... If you put red in here, it's going to be orange. It's not really going to be red. So you have to up the food color quantity. Mm -hmm. More drops, and the food color will work better. Unlike the vitamin B2 riboflavin tablets that you're putting in, food color, you can adjust the quantity that you put in. It will change the, the, the tone. Is it the tone that you're changing? Yeah, I, don't, I think it's like, yeah, the intensity of the color. If you want like a light green, put a couple drops in. If you want a darker green... But like 25. <laughs> <laughs> well, most boxes of the of the food color you use will have some recipes on the back. And, you know, if you want it bright red, use 25 drops. And if you want it light red, you like pink, then use 5 drops. So, mm -hmm. unlike the vitamin B2, the food color does make a difference how much you put in. Boy, that crystallized fast. Yeah. A lot faster than this can be. But this is going to be translucent, and that's just the mm -hmm. wonderful clouds. All right, so uh, let's see. <laughs> Wait, show it again. Glowing pretty well. So it's kind of hard to tell in our video, but John, is it glowing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely glowing. And was that just a, uh, a small piece that broke off? Yeah, that was something that had been crusted to the spoon. So, so that's the that's the question, right? How does oh, it taste? Man, that's really good. Is it good? Yeah. Nice. All right, I'm excited. It's very strong. <laughs> strong peppermint flavor. Mm -hmm. Just take a little chunk. Mmm. So this is just stuff that had crusted to the spoon. It's pretty it's good. Really strong though. It's intense, yeah. So, again, you got to make lots of batches to experiment with this sugar candy. Mm -hmm. And it's not that much. I mean, you know, it's a week's worth of candy. So every week you make another batch. There you go. Nick, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that was that was awesome. Um, I was going to say who's brave enough to taste it, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys willing to taste our candy? Dude, I can't wait. <laughs> yep. 
Good response. <laughs> yeah, see, that's still, still taking a while. The whistle, the one that we made about an hour ago, is just starting to solidify, but it's still liquidy. So I don't know if we're going to have it ready and all. But we have some of the, the droppings, and you can, you know, the leave-ins. And they do glow. Man, that's awesome. This green color is just glowing like crazy. So, John, now that we have uh, some candy bits going, what's the best way to store these when you, uh, when you want to save them? So you definitely want to keep them not airtight, but you want to keep them out of the, in a cool, dark area. So I put my candy in Ziploc, or okay. I wrap it individually in uh, saran wrap, or um, cellophane wrap, or... What about more aluminum foil? You could definitely put it in aluminum foil, but uh, it wouldn't glow. You can see it glow through the aluminum foil. Mm. So maybe cellophane paper, parchment paper. That's one, yeah. I mean, you, what candy, like uh, little, the candies you get, like Starlight Mints and things, they come in uh, a cellophane rather than, um, uh, you know, um, stretchy saran wrap that you use to store food. That works. But cellophane is what professional candy mm -hmm. companies use. Mm -hmm. And that's what I use. That way I can give it out to people. If you were to leave this candy um, out, is there a time period in which it would stop glowing? It would cease to glow? I've never had it. I had a piece of candy from last Halloween that I found in February, and it still glowed. Mm. You know, there's probably a half-life, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. If I see candy, I eat it, so. <laughs> I'd have to be, I'd have to lock it, lock the candy in something to get a time. So are there uh, any more questions from uh, campers, Ben and Brian, or uh, anything else guys want to add? Uh, we got one from Leo. Will it grow, will it glow less if you put too much food coloring? No. The food coloring doesn't affect it. Even this, I know it's really hard to see, but I want to try to show you this chunk. Leo, look at, the, look at this uh, camera down here. This is pretty dark green. It kind of matches my shirt here. And um, there's not a lot of translucence to this um, leftover stuff. It's not like the clear candy. It's pretty dense, but it glows super bright. So that's a great question but it uh, doesn't affect it at all. The luminescence, the, the ones that are more clear, you, you have more shine through glow, but I don't think it's brighter. Because anything that's glowing is because of the photons, and that's reflective, and that's bounce, not illuminating through. Very nice. I, I don't know what that means, but uh, <laughs> it, do, it doesn't glow any less. Cool. Uh, John, what's the best way for us to, uh, to get in contact with you if uh, we have questions about the Kryptonite candy or want to follow more of your projects uh, uh -huh. that we'll be building up for Halloween? Google Plus, circle me up. I, have, uh, I post things daily. I share other news uh, because I work for O'Reilly and I work with Make. I have a lot of really cool tech stuff on my uh, Google Plus mm -hmm. feed, um, like some... Olympic sprinter or 3D printed shoes a couple weeks ago I put on wow. there and they were really, really cool. And so my feed has more stuff than just Maker Camp, but uh, that's the best place to find me is on Google+. Plus. All right, cool. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll have the Junior Counselor Hangout uh, about half an hour from now. We'll start that at 1.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, today, John will be actually joining us for the Hangout, so you can ask him uh, some more questions about the candy. Uh, we'll have time to show you uh, how the whistle turned out and once it's dry and uh, cooled. And uh, we'll hope to see you soon. So remember, if you make some of these candies, uh, share them uh, with Maker Camp by using the hashtag Maker Camp. We'll happy to reshare them and uh, check us out. And we'll see you tomorrow uh, for Theoretical Thursday. So thanks, everyone. See you next time. See ya. Bye.